They're all gonna pay. Things are gonna get a lot better around here once I'm in charge. Yeah! Things are about to get awesome! High five! Or, you know, not. We're here at Gamescom catching up on Borderlands, the pre-sequel, and uh, as, as has been the case when I've done interviews on this game, it's one representative of Gearbox and one representative of 2K Australia, sort of always keeping that collaboration in mind. And, and here, at, here at Gamescom, I think Claptrap has been the sort of the big story people have gotten their hands on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what, what, what you wanted to do there and what he brings from both of your perspectives? Sure. Uh, Character-wise, uh, Claptrap's always been really divisive. He's like annoying, but also sort of maybe kind of endearing. And uh, a lot of the designers at 2K Australia and at Gearbox, uh, dudes like Jonathan Hemingway and Tommy Westerman and Matt Armstrong and, and, and John Owen and, and uh, a lot of other people really wanted to sort of get the character of Claptrap into his actual skills. So he plays like Claptrap is as a person. He's chaotic, he's kind of annoying, he affects everybody else around him. Players will either really hate him or really like him depending on how he buffs them or screws with them in accidental ways. Uh, he's a really, really interesting character to play. You really never know what you're going to get with him because he's so random. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, we wanted also like a character that would be kind of advanced and um, like difficult to play. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of, the, the, his action skill um, looks at whatever's happening on the battlefield and analyzes the situation and picks, a, picks a, an action skill from another Borderlands um, Vault Hunter, um, but with some kind of weird buggy malware. So with, 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 um, with Claptrap, you know, it's all about, um, you know, being great at responding to dynamic unfolding events. And if you do that really well, then you're going you're gonna to be like really a badass and you're going to like buff the entire team and everyone's going to love you. But if you don't do that well, then you're basically just going to be Claptrap and everyone's just going to go whatever, get out of my life. So, so what, what changes with, with uh, because it's always been there, but what changes from, from like a narrative perspective when you're actually in his in his shoes uh well because we have a different dialogue depending on which character you are when you're talking to different npcs or whatever uh it basically means that when you play as like nisha then like everyone's kind of interested in what you have to say and they think you're really cool and da 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 and when you're claptrap everybody's just like what are you talking about? shut up claptrap we don't care like nobody seems to respect you very much um which is fun in its own weird way. It's like playing as Charlie Brown, I guess. It's a Charlie Brown simulator. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get to sort of be the guy that everybody poops on and sort of know what it's like to live as Claptrap and, and hopefully feel like, well, maybe in the future I should be nice to Claptrap when I see him in other Borderlands games and that kind of stuff. Hmm. And, and uh, I guess that's one of the things that you're also bringing from 2K Australia, that the fact that the characters actually talk and that the narrative is brought forward in that sense uh, during the gameplay. Yeah, I guess um, it's something that um, you know Gearbox dabbled with um, in, in the past, and we were all like super excited about the direction that was going, and and so um, you'll see a lot more of that in in, in pre sequel. Um, the characters are going to have more to say, and they're going to um, participate more actively in, in in the narrative. So, so speaking of the the cast of characters, I feel like you've gone from a, a sort of a, a strange cast to a, a little bit stranger cast, yeah. and now it's like it's all out there, even stranger than ever before. Um, fr from both of your perspectives, I, I don't know exactly who, who made the calls for it, it, you know, it's a collaboration, I guess, but, but where did the inspiration for all the, all the cast of this game come from? Uh, well, it came from knowing that we wanted it to take place between Borderlands 1 and 2, and we wanted it to go on the moon, which means that if we're going on the moon, that probably means it should be about Hyperion, and if it's going to be about Hyperion, it should probably be about Jack, and if it's about Jack, then, well, what characters do we have that are already in Borderlands 2 that kind of know Jack? So we went, well, Wilhelm, he was a boss, we could use him. Nisha, uh, she was his girlfriend, and she, you know, was a friend of his, so we can, we can use her. And then Claptrap, we thought, well, that would be fucking weird, so let's just do that. And then Athena was kind of just this, this lingering thing of, like, well... We want somebody to round out the cast like gender-wise. We want two men and two women. Mm. And we haven't seen her since Borderlands 1, and it would be fun to sort of bring her back and have her be a character where, because like, you know what happens to Nisha and Wilhelm and Claptrap. You know that they all survived to Borderlands 2, and then some of, the peop some of them die in Borderlands 2. But we were, it was also kind of nice to have a character where you didn't know what was going to happen to her, essentially. And uh, it, we, we just kind of missed Athena and felt like bringing her back. <laughs> and and from, from a, a gameplay perspective, like because obviously Gearbox are very sort of the story, the, the universe is theirs. Uh, what do you feel that these characters bring in, in terms of the gameplay mixing things up? Well, I, I think um, their uh, action skills and skill trees um, are 
they've, they've got a lot of meat in them. And, um, you know, there's, there's very few skills, if any, which are just like tweaking a few stats here and there. All of them like add um, like pretty dramatic um, new abilities that um, round out your character. And each of the skill trees is, um, you know, far more divergent, I think. Um, so I, I think as a cast of characters, um, you know, we've really tried to mine the character for who they are and, and what, um, you know, what they can do and translate that into some really interesting skill trees. Um, so, uh, you know, each of the characters plays really differently. Each of them within their skill trees can, um, you know, play really differently. Like, uh, I think Athena, um, you know, one of her skill trees is entirely about um, buffing her kinetic aspis, which is the little shield that she uses during her action skill. Um, but another skill tree, which is um, Sauronic Storm, is about elemental mastery. And if you go down that tree, you don't really even need to use the, the kinetic aspis too much. So, you know, it, it, you, there are so many options for uh, adapting your play style and choosing what you like best. Um, and you're going to find something fun in there somewhere. And then of course, that's just for yourself add in co-op and, and you know there's a lot of different dynamics that could take place between characters even though you know, you're playing against the same characters the, there could be a lot of different dynamics between the two yeah for sure I think if you're playing co-op and you know the, the different characters that you're playing with um, you're gonna have a very different experience and especially if you have claptrap in the mix because claptrap not only is like completely insane in and of himself if you're playing claptrap but um, he basically modifies everything on the, on the, on the battlefield all the, all the all the other players are going to be affected by his action skill at some point, um, and they're going to love him or hate him for it. <laughs> we, we briefly glanced over the, the fact that it's on the moon, uh, which is, it changes a lot of things. Uh, can, can, what's the significance? Where, is it something that you've always sort of had in the fiction that this is an important place, this is somewhere where we want to set a game? Uh, well, we knew we wanted to go to the moon weirdly super early in Borderlands 2 when we were doing marketing for it because we just showed like, oh yeah, there's this like space station on the moon and that's how they get robots down. We just thought it was a cool way to like have robots appear in the map rather than having them like come out of doors or whatever. Like, oh, it'd be cool if they came from the sky. And immediately when we started showing that, people were like, oh, so we get to go to the moon in Borderlands 2, right? That's the end of the game is so we go to the moon. We were like, fuck, no, you don't. Sorry. <laughs> but then so when it came time to do pre where well, we have to go to the moon. And then the guys at 2K Australia came up with a bunch of really cool gameplay stuff that completely changes the Borderlands core combat loop because you're on the moon. Yeah, I, I think that that is something that, that it brings. I mean, it's not just a cool place to be. It's really twists and turns the gameplay a lot. Yeah, that's definitely something that we um, were super excited about being able to do because like, I mean, you, you go to the moon and you have a certain am amount of expectations. Like, you know, if you go to our moon, you're going to expect no atmosphere, you're going to expect low gravity. And so we wanted to bring those promises and really make sure that, um, you know, they were being um, explored properly. Um, and the coolest thing that came out of that was um, the low gravity gameplay and the way that that changes the core combat loop. You're not really stuck to battle lines anymore. You can cross them in leaps and bounds. Um, you know, you can use jump pads and, and air boosts and things like that to, um, you know, make your character double jump and fly across the battlefield and slam down like a meteorite and explode guys into space. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot more dynamic and, you know, those new dimensions of verticality and mobility um, really enhance the combat, I think. And it's, uh, it makes it um, chaotic, it makes it fun, um, and uh, it, uh, it makes it really hard to go back to Borderlands 2, <laughs> to be honest. It yeah. does. Well, yeah. All right. There's, there's like 10 million players there that, <laughs> that, that, that can't go back then. Uh, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> they'll play pre-sequel and they'll yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Right. Well, well maybe, maybe you have to stick to the moon then if, if it's so much better. But I either way, I mean, that, that's an interesting thing because it poses a lot of, it has a lot of knockoff effects as well because when you change to more vertical gameplay, the levels have to change as well. So how do you sort of approach that? That was definitely a challenge. Um, you know, we were coming in, um, you know, new to the franchise and, you know, learning all the ropes from coming off the Bioshock series um, at 2K Australia. And um, we, we definitely had to adapt the way we build the levels um, to accommodate um, the, the new mobility that players have. So, um, you know, they can now get on top of things that they were never able to previously get on top of, like buildings and, um, you know, cliffs and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, that basically from the very beginning we had to s really start tuning the way we approach um, building the world um, because we know that players can access all of it. And I guess it's going to give rise to a lot more interesting YouTube videos and stuff like that because people can really play around with it in a different way than they were previously. Yeah, I'm excited and terrified by what players are going to be able to do. <laughs> and it's pretty soon, it's, it's not a long way to go now everyone feeling comfortable that you're not going to join that 
increasing number of games slipping into 2015? Uh, we're definitely not slipping into 2015, as far as I, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're planning for October 17th, and yeah. Yep, um, planning uh, October 17th in Europe and October 14th in uh, in the US. And PC, PS3, Xbox 360. Yep, that's right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you.